Very little in the way of clouds the past couple days. We are literally in the doldrums, waiting out the arrival of winter. So this is a good time to jump into the weather school. And I want to talk about a subject that's dear to my heart and should be dear to yours too. It's the evolution of the Radioson network. Let's take a look back in 1945. This is the extent of coverage that we saw Obviously very good in the U.S., but pretty scattered across Asia and Europe, and pretty much nothing down south except in Australia. Fast forward to 1955, things were looking much better. You may be wondering about the red spots. Those are radio sound observations without humidity data, but it's still valid data. Here's how things looked in 1975. Very good. In fact, 1,100 stations reporting, and we got data for pretty much all over the world. Not so good in the oceans. But by 2015, down to 860 stations. Yeah, things thinned out quite a bit. Why are the models doing as well as they're doing? Where is this data coming from? Well, this was touched on a little bit back in 1990 in this paper called Degradation of the North American Radio Sound Network. Back in the 80s, there was extensive budget cuts going on, and there was a lot of concern that the models were going to gradually get worse, or at least see diminishing returns. This paper condemned the decision-making process at NOAA you can see that there was just not much communication back then about the different changes to the radio sound data. So over the 30 years since then, what has changed? Well, the surface network is better than ever. But one big improvement has been with, for example, aircraft soundings, ACARS, AMDAR. These have filled in a lot of upper air data, especially over the oceans. And satellite sensing. It's not quite as good as a radio sound measurement, but you can see the density is just vast across many parts of the world. Now, cloud cover does interfere with that to a certain extent, but still, this is a tremendous amount of data. We get probably millions of observations every day. Also, infrared imagery, water vapor provides additional data. And buoy reports have definitely picked up. The automation of drifting buoys, that really fills in the data over the oceans. And this is where things come together. The supercomputers at centers like ECMWF and INSEP the key to all this is the data assimilation process. This has grown into an extremely sophisticated science. It's kind of its own thing nowadays. And that's the art of taking limited observations, or in some cases, satellite data, which has numerous observations, and taking all that mixed data and synthesizing them into an accurate picture of what's happening. And that uses forecast fields and a lot of statistical math and comes up with a unified picture of what's happening. And that's really helped the accuracy of the models quite a bit, especially offshore where there's limited data. And these surface maps that you see every day, I'm actually using GFS data for the offshore sea level pressure and thickness fields because they've gotten so accurate that there's no reason not to use them. So that gives us a very good picture of what's happening with these systems approaching the U.S. And here I've combined it with observed fields. 
So that's kind of using all the available data, all the best elements of what we have. And every day we use that in our opening surface analysis. So let's take a look at that. There's the picture for today. We're looking at sea level pressure with the black lines and the red and blue lines that are dashed. Those are going to be thickness, which is kind of an average measure of temperature in the lowest three kilometers. So clearly, we have a lot of cold air coming south out of Canada this afternoon. 30s in South Dakota, 34 there at Rapid City, and 37 at Pierre. Not quite cold enough for snow, but ahead of that, we are getting some rain and thunderstorms in Minnesota. Weak cold front coming south, 50s and 60s back behind that, and a wind shift. And out ahead of it, some late summer type tropical air mass dew points coming up into the 60s. Almost 70 there at Waco. So it is warming up, and we're going to see a lot more of that warm weather over the next several days. Some changes in the northwestern U.S. That's some cold air. We can tell that that's on the way out because the pressure gradient is oriented from southwest to northeast, or I should say the geostrophic winds. So the actual pressure gradient yeah, that's where the low pressure is. It's offshore, but the winds are flowing from southwest to northeast. And that's dislodging this cold air, 52 there at Seattle at this hour, and bringing up warmer air from the south. And taking a look out in the Pacific, there's our next system, probably heading for the Pacific Northwest. And then taking a look further up there in Alaska, temperatures continue to fall. 20s and 30s, starting to dig in for some of that wintry weather we're going to be seeing in the next few weeks. But across the Northwest Territories, some warm air coming up from the south, so we've warmed up into the 30s along the Arctic Ocean coast. And then checking out the Atlantic, not very much going on. A system there in Hudson Bay not doing very much, and an outgoing system in Newfoundland. And the temperature records expected for today. A lot of weather programming tells you what the records were. I like to focus on what they're going to be. So we're using the official weather service forecast data. 75 there at, uh, what is BDR Bridgeport, Connecticut? So a warm day along the East Coast and 87 there at Sarasota. None of that breaking any records, but the one up in Connecticut will be tying the record for the date. Tomorrow morning, any records? No, not even close. But afternoon temperatures will be coming up in parts of the southern U.S. 91 at Del Rio, 90 at Brownsville, and continued warm in the northeastern U.S. And for Friday starting to sound like a broken record, coming up into the upper 80s in parts of South Texas, 88 at Austin, 92 at Del Rio. That will tie the record for the date set a year ago and warm once again in Florida. And let's just check out Saturday real quick. Yep, warm once again for Texas, warm for Louisiana and Florida. And for Sunday, more of the same. Yeah, that's a broken record for sure. Well, focusing our attention on the tropics, things have wound down quite a bit. The five-day outlook, looking pretty quiet. Just a little bit of activity going on at SPC, marginal risk for southeastern Minnesota. And just looking at this at first glance, we can see that's back behind this area here and... I would expect the cold core low to be in this area around Sioux Falls. So probably as the temperatures come up, we're going to be seeing some cold core convection. And we're pretty clear on watches and mesoscale discussions. No storm reports either. So let's take a look at the satellite. The cold core low definitely evident right in this area here. 
you can see that cold pocket there on the GFS centered around Sioux Falls, Sioux City. And we'll put the skew T right in the middle of that bullseye. And that's going to be the coldest mid-level conditions. Looks like there's just not much warm air or moisture in the lower levels. So it's kind of being undercut by a lot of cold air and the dry slot. Well, just not really seeing that build in. So the prospect of cold core convection looks pretty weak. And I think mostly we're going to be focusing on this area here. Maybe the nose of the moisture where it comes up from the southeast. And the closest proximity of that high theta E air to the colder conditions in the mid-levels. Try a different color. Yeah, that right there. Wherever those can be in close proximity, that's going to be your best potential for weather. It does look like the cells are having some trouble organizing. It's just kind of a cold, dry environment. But further north, some anvils poking out through the overcast. Those are embedded CBs moving up towards the Twin Cities. Here's a useful product for putting it together. This is the SPC mesoscale analysis. Looking at the surface mixing ratio, that's kind of a proxy for dew point, that's going to be the shading. So the green is where you have a whole lot of moisture. The blue is where the moisture is a little bit less. So definitely a moisture nose extending up into Iowa. The red is going to be your potential temperature. That's theta, the same thing. It's kind of your temperature reduced to sea level. And that outlines the front pretty well. So the cold front, it's going to run something like that right there. And we can bring that north as a warm front and looks like a secondary low further up north. And then we catch some of the lake air mass around Lake Michigan. The fields get kind of distorted, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. We do see that the moisture nose is coming up in eastern Iowa. And so there may be some potential in this area this afternoon, but it is probably being overspread just off the surface with dry air. So that'll gradually reduce prospects along the front. And very likely by sunset, things should be winding down west of the Mississippi. Let's take a quick look around the country. Southwestern U.S. being overspread by Cirrus with the next system coming in from the Pacific. Further north in California, Nevada, Oregon, we get into the thick of it. Lots of mountain wave activity. This is all Altocumulus and Cirrus forming up into standing lenticular clouds. Washington getting some rain, onshore flow, which is usually wet, but they're catching a little bit of a break, probably a shortwave ridge approaching the area, but things will likely start deteriorating later tonight. In the northern plains, we catch that frontal system down to the south. This is mostly in a cold advection zone, so mostly a lot of upper level clouds. The central plains in that cold punch coming in from the north. So northwesterly winds and dry. Down in Oklahoma, you can almost pick out the frontal boundary. Now, this appears to consist mostly of stratocumulus and low altocumulus, but I think we might pick up the frontal boundary kind of in this region right there, and it becomes dry on the tail end. In Texas, we have a recovering tropical air mass. Started out with some stratus and fog in the hill country this morning. This is all under southerly flow. But you notice as we get closer to that front, which is up in this area right here, we start picking up some gravity waves, right like that. And you can see that they appear to propagate to the south. Now, what's weird about this is if we take a skew T for the area right now, we'll put that on the Fort Worth area, for example. You can see that the winds are all out of the west and the south. There's no flow coming out of the north. Cross-check that a little bit further north, around buoy. No northerly flow. So obviously what we're seeing here is some wave propagation. Yeah, I'm looking at skew T's and I can't find any 
this morning that show northerly flow in that region. So those are some very complex wave effects. It's kind of like the traffic jam and that you sometimes see on the freeway. There's a simulation of a traffic jam and you can see how the wave propagates backwards, even though all of the traffic is moving the opposite direction. So very likely we're looking at the same sort of effect going on in the mid-levels. A few thunderstorms offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. That's the tail end of that polar front, kind of lurking quite a distance offshore. A nice day in the Carolinas. Can't always say much about that. A few forest fires appear to get going there in central North Carolina. Also a nice day in the northeast U.S., but we've got an upper-level system traversing the area, producing some stratocumulus and out cumulus layers and maybe a few showers in that and then we'll close off with this view of the hudson bay region very tight wound up low just north of fort severn we saw this weather system on the surface map yeah that's it right there kind of winding up as an occlusion and looks like it's kind of spiraling towards the ontario coast and there can be some very tight temperature changes at the surface, and that can lead to the development of polar lows, very small scale mesoscale low that sometimes develops within these systems. We see that a lot on the Alaskan and Siberian coasts. This is probably one example from last November. This is kind of upside down, but this is the Siberian coast near Beringovsky, Lavrentia. That's it right there. You can see these clouds are definitely convective. They look like highly sheared thunderstorms, and you can see the vertical extent of this cumulus field. This is cold waters, but you can see how vertical everything is. These can be really a mess if you were to take a boat into those regions. That gives you some of your dramatic, stormy, cold weather seas that you sometimes see on those fishing shows set in the Bering Sea. And that's all I have for this edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for joining, and we'll see you all back here on Friday. Have a good one. Bye-bye.